وعشيرتكم وأموال اقترفتموها وتجارة تخشون كسادها وتجارة تخشون كسادها ومساكن ترضونها أحب إليكم من الله رسوله وجهات وجهاد في سبيله فترى بصوح حتى يأتي الله بأمره والله لا يهدي القوم لقد نصركم الله في مواطن كثيرة ويوم حنين ويوم حنين إذ أعجبتكم كثرتكم فلم تغن عنكم شيئا ألم تغن عنكم شيئا وضاقت عليكم الأرض بما رحبت ثم ثم أنزل الله سكينة على رسوله وعلى المؤمنين وأنزل جنودا لم تروا
وأنزل جنودا لم تروها وعذب الذين كفروا وذلك جزاء الكافرين صدق الله العلي العظيم صلوات السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته. Thank you all for coming to our Arabian lecture series on the Chronicles of Karbala by Father Christopher Claressi. Father Christopher is a South African Catholic priest who holds a BST from the Pontifical Urban University in Rome and a PhD from the Pontifical Institute for Arabic and Islamic Studies, the PISAI, also in Rome. He's at present a resident faculty member of PISAI, lecturing there in Shi'i Islamic studies, Quran and Islamic ethics, and is a visiting lecturer at the Pontifical Beda College in Rome, where he lectures in fundamental theology, ecclesiology, and Mariology. This year's lecture series is sponsored on behalf of the Mohumin, displayed on the TV outside, in the cha uh, outside the chapel located in the main area. Please can we recite a Surah Fatiha for all these and all other Marhumin Al Fatiha? Also, on the note of health and safety, in the case of any emergencies, fire exits are located at the back of the chapel. Uh, in the main area, in, in the foyer, and also by the dining room as well. After today's talk, we will be hosting a Q&A with Father Christopher, so please have all of your questions ready. Without further ado, I'll finally stop talking, and I would like to invite Father Christopher to deliver tonight's lecture. Please can we welcome him with a loud salawat. Sallu ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. Uh, What I'm going to attempt to do tonight, for better or for worse, is to offer you some very preliminary thoughts, and I underline that with a great dark line, very preliminary thoughts about this captivating figure of Al-Abbas. When I was younger, I used to do my research more quickly. Now, as I get older, I do it much more slowly because I've come to understand that every piece of information, no matter how tiny, needs to be examined because it could well be part of the story. And that's why I say preliminary. I've been working on his life for about a year, but a year now in research is a very short time. So he's known, of course, by his devotees, um, by a number of names. Let me see if I can get this to work. By a number of names, the moon, the qamar of the Bani Hashim, the as the water bearer, the carrier of water, the, the batal, the hero of the Alkami river or stream. He's known as the Hamil, that is the carrier of the standard of Al Hussein, as the Kabsh the battalion head, as the Bab al-Hawa'ij, the, the gateway of things that people need. Those are his al-Kab and his kunya, two that are best known. He's known as Abu al-Fadl and also Abu Kirba, the, the father of the water skin, the father of the, one who, of, the, of the skin for water. Now, even within 
the circle of Shi faith and scholarship, he is both academically and spiritually a very elusive person. It's very, very hard to get hold of Al-Abbas and study him. Partly this is because the, the, the heroic deeds for which he are, he's remembered, as we will see tonight, are written about very extensively in the very early Sunni historical sources based on this great Shia scholar Abu Mihnaf. As the years go by, in the Sunni sources, the stories get shorter and shorter and shorter, reduced to just a sentence. Whereas in the Shia sources, they grow bigger and bigger, and all kinds of details appear which we didn't see before. But he's also elusive because I, I think that it's part of his character to hide. I think that Abbas hides behind his brother so that his brother is always at the forefront. He never, in any moment, as we will see, allows himself to become the center of the story of the attention. And I think that in sacrificing himself to get water for the women and children, especially the children of the Ahl Bayt, he is an anti-model. In other words, a model against selfishness and egotism or egoism, some of the terrible things that plague our society today. So I start with Al-Mufid in his Kitab Al-Irshad because Al-Mufid tells us nine specific things about Al-Abbas. And those nine things are a very nice foundation upon which we can build the story. So the first point that Al-Mufid confirms for us is that he is the son of Ali. He is the oldest of three of four brothers. The three others are Abdullah, and then Uthman and then Jaffa. Now, they're not always named in that order in the text, but almost certainly after Al-Abbas, Abdullah is the oldest, probably about 25, followed by Uthman, about 21, followed, about, followed by Jaffa, somewhere between 19 and 21. These four sons, all of them are born of Fatima bint Hizam, Um al-Banin, sons of Ali, and all four of them are going to be martyred at various moments in the battle, but just before the martyrdom of Al Hussein. Secondly, Al Mufid tells us that on the night of the 9th of Muharram, Shimr, who was related to them through their mother, because he also was a member of the Banu Kilab. So Shimr comes and he stands in front of the tent of, um, of, of, of Al Hussein and his family. And he offers safe passage off the battlefield for the four brothers, but not for Al-Hussein. Of course, with Al-Abbas as their spokesman, the four brothers say to him, may God curse you and the security that you try to offer us, but not to the grandson of the messenger of God. Thirdly, on that same night, I think, but it might be a different night, Al Hussein instructs Al Abbas to ride towards the enemy and meet them and find out what they're doing, what they want. So I think that this is the first of the two great interventions of Al Abbas on the field of Karbala, and you will find it in all of the early Sunni sources, this moment. It is a very particular moment, although it has some problems in the text. So he's accompanied by somewhere between 20 and 50 men. So it couldn't have been on the day of the battle, this. It had to be before because Al Hussein could not have sent well more than half of his men to negotiate on the day of the battle. These men go with Al Abbas, and upon the orders of Al Hussein, Al Abbas persuades them not to do anything. He says to them, What is it you want? And they say, Well, we're under orders. One of two, two options for you, either you submit to Yazid or we're going to kill you. So Al Abbas says, well then don't do anything. I need to go back now and tell Al Hussein what you have said. So he goes back by himself because his companions, <coughs> excuse me, stay behind to try and dissuade these soldiers from fighting the army of the Prophet's grandson. 
Al Hussein hears what Al Abbas has to say, <clears throat> and he sends him back a second time across the battlefield. This is before the battle has begun. Sends him back a second time to ask them if they would stay back for one night so that they can pray, so that the Ahl Bayt can pray. I'm pretty sure that at this stage, <clears throat> the enemy thought that Al Hussein was thinking about surrendering. I'm convinced of that. So the army said, that's fine, we'll give you a night. What they didn't know that he wasn't thinking about surrendering at all. He simply wanted a night in order to pray. So in this moment, Al Abbas <coughs> sorry, <coughs> proves himself to be an exceptionally good diplomat. He's able to persuade the enemy, he's able to talk to them, and he's faithful in carrying back the messages that he receives. There might be a suggestion here as well that some of the soldiers involved in this negotiation were not too keen about going into battle against Al Hussein to begin with. They were being driven by their leaders and they were quite happy to stay away for a night. The fourth point is that <clears throat> Al Hussein then makes this famous speech on the night of the 9th of Muharram, inviting his followers to leave, saying to them, look, it's only me they want, so you go. I release you from all the vows you've made, all the promises you've made, and it is Al Abbas who begins the protest saying we will never do such a thing. So they disobey the, the, the order of Al Hussein out of loyalty to him. Fifth point is that on the, on the morning of Ashura, Al Hussein gives his standard to Al Abbas. This is an interesting and it's an important point when we talk about the carrying of the water. But at this moment, on the morning of the battle, Al Abbas becomes the standard bearer. So after his negotiation with the enemy the night before, this is his second major role in Karbala as standard bearer for Al Hussein. Sixthly, Al Mufid tells us that when Al Abbas sees how many people have been killed, so this is now much later on during the battle, perhaps we're heading towards the end of the battle, when he sees how many have been killed, he invites his three brothers to go before him and to be martyred. And one of the reasons he does this, the text says, is because none of them have children. He's the only one who's got a son, al Fadl. And so he, he invites them to go forward to be martyred in the cause of God, and then he will become their heir, and as soon as he's become their heir, he himself will be martyred. Point seven. So if you can forget about the slide, because I see now in my old age, I've mixed up some of the points. But point seven is where Al Mufid becomes a bit problematic. Because this is the moment where we are talking about water and thirst. And Al Mufid, as a later Shia scholar here, is less clear than the early Sunni scholars about what happens. What Al Mufid tells us is that Al Hussein's thirst becomes so severe that he himself attempts to get either to the river itself or to some water of some description or maybe to the Al Khami, the, the, the tributary of the river. In front of him is Al Abbas, but the emphasis at this moment is on Al Hussein himself attempting to get to water, but the horsemen of Umar bin Sa'ad block their access. So it is very important for me that writing 300 years after Tabari, or, or maybe, maybe 300 years after Abu Mihnaf, about 150 years after Tabari, Al Mufid has put the moment that Abbas attempts to get water on the day of the battle. But I'm not sure if that's correct, as we will see now. And he's put it as a joint venture by Al Hussein and his half brother Al Abbas towards the end of the battle to fight their way to the, to the river. Al Mufid tells us then that he is surrounded, Al Abbas, at this moment. He is separated from Al Hussein. He begins to attack the enemy single handedly, but he is vastly outnumbered, and so he is killed. And and Al Mufid names at least two of the enemy soldiers who took place in his killing. And then Al Mufid tells us one last thing. He tells us where the body of Al Abbas is buried on the road to Ghadiriya. So Al Abbas gives us these 
nine or so very interesting points about Al, uh, Al Mufid gives us these nine very interesting points about Al Abbas, but it's just around the question of the fetching of water that he gets a little shaky and we need to understand it. So, what I wanted really to talk about tonight was that moment, the fetching of the water, because it's the thing for which Abbas is remembered and celebrated. In fact, he's named for the fact that he went to fetch water. So, the earliest account that we have of the water fetching comes from the first Shia Maktal, and that really is Abu Mihna. I said last night, we don't possess his Maktal, we possess bits of his Maktal in, in two or three very early Sunni scholars who've simply taken the information from uh, Abu Mihnaf and put it into their own histories. We're very glad they did that because we now have fragments, maybe even a core of that original Maktal in these three early writers. So remember that Al-Mufid, writing 300 years after this, puts the attempt to get water on the day of Ashura, maybe towards the end of the battle. But that's not how Abu Mihnaf tells it. So this is the story of the first Shia scholar we have writing of this. When the thirst of Al Hussein and his followers grew severe, he summoned his brother Al Abbas and dispatched him with 30 horsemen and 20 foot soldiers. That is 50 of his men. He couldn't have done that towards the end of the battle. It's impossible. A, because most of them have been killed, and B, because it would have been a terrible error to send 50 of your men away at the height of battle. They approached the water, says Abu Mihnaf, by night. So it couldn't have been the day of Ashura. It had to be one of the nights leading up to Ashura. A man called Nafi bin Hilal al Jamali went ahead of them with the standard. Al Abbas at this moment according to Abu Mihnaf, is not the standard bearer. He becomes the standard bearer, Mufid says, on the morning of the battle. At this moment, there is somebody else carrying the battle, a very interesting man called Nafi. And then we meet a second char character called Amr bin Hajjaj al-Zubaydi. He is the leader of the forces blocking the water, and he shouts out, who's that? And Nafi says, it's Nafi bin Hilal. And he says, what brings you here? And Nafi says, we've come to drink from this water, which you are stopping us, or from which you're debarring us. And Amr says, help yourself. Nafi says, no, by God, we're not going to drink water. Not a drop while Al Hussein is thirsty and his companions, the ones you see with me. So Amr said, then you're not going to drink. There's no way you're going to drink water if you're going to find a way for Al Hussein to do so. In fact, we've been put in this place to keep them, not you, not Nafi, them refers to Al Hussein and his companions from the water. So Abu Mihnaf then continues when the companions drew near to Nafi, he said, Don't listen to him, fill your water skins. So the men charge at Amr bin Al Hajjaj, and there's a bit of a skirmish between the two sets, the, the 30 or 50 men of Al Hussein and those who are guarding the water, Al Abbas and Nafi attack and hold this group back. So we don't know how many men Amr had as he guarded the water. We know that Al Hussein, or at least Al Abbas and Nafi, were with somewhere between 20 and 50, but we're not told how big the opposing force was. But, but these two, Al Abbas, and Nafi attack them and hold them back. And then they turn to their men and say, move ahead. So the men come and they, they fill their water skins. And then the followers of Al-Hussein return with the water skins to Al-Hussein. So according to Abu Mihnaf, the water was successfully fetched by Nafi and Al-Abbas. And it was done at night, and it was carried back to Al Hussein successfully. And Al Abbas was not killed on his way back, but was killed the next day, perhaps in a second attempt to get water. Happily for us, um, this story has been taken from Abu Mihnaf, and it has been kept preserved by these historians. So Abu Mihnaf dies in 774. 
But his story of the water fetching, as we've just read it, is taken from his text and put into the history of the Sunni al-Baladhuri. He dies a hundred years later, 892. It's also taken from Abu Mihnaf and put into a second Sunni historian called Dinawari, who dies in 895, so he and Baladhuri are contemporaries. And then it's put into a third historian, a Taburi, who dies a hundred years or less than a hundred years, 50 years after them. So basically, what I'm suggesting is that the most important story of Al-Abbas is first written down by a Shia Maktal or a Shia historian, and it is preserved for us by these three early Sunni historians. Baladri was writing in Baghdad, uh, Dinawari was a Persian, and, and so was Tabari. All of them make tiny changes and amendments, so if you line the stories up, you see tiny differences. But for convenience sake, let's just say what we're dealing with is four primary texts, one Shia and three Sunni, which tell a very, very fulsome story. And I, I just make a couple of points of notes about this, these stories. Baladri and Dinawari establish the pedigree of Al Hussein through his mother, not through his father. He is the son of Umm al Banin. It's a very important point. Umm al Banin is already a personality who is known quite clearly, because it seems clear to me that the Sunni historians would name him after his father. Now, they're either attempting to discredit Ali by not naming him, or they are showing us that Umm al Banin is already a, a fixed personality in people's minds and they know who she is. Al Baladri is the only one who doesn't also mention that Al-Abbas is a brother of Al-Hussein. For some reason, he decides to leave that single detail out. In all the four texts, so our Shia and our three Sunnis, the person who leads the attempt to water is not Al-Abbas. It's a man called Nafi bin Hilal. Only one person, after Abu Mihnaf, and that's Tabari, mentions that he was also the standard bearer for that particular moment of the battle. In other texts, it's quite clear that Al-Abbas becomes the standard bearer for his brother on the day of Al-Ashura. None of the texts, thirdly, actually mention the name Euphrates. Most of them just talk about water. They use the word al ma so it could be the Euphrates that these men are heading towards. It could also be a tributary like al alqami or it could be just some sort of dam or place where water had been stored up. Uh, Baladri calls it Sharia. That is a watering place, a place where you go down to water animals. He uses the word Sharia, and the others use the word water in Arabic, but nobody mentions the name al alqami and nobody mentions the name Euphrates. Abu Mihnaf, followed by Tabari, note when it happened. They said it happened by night. So, the water was banned or debarred on the 2nd of Muharram. So we are now on the 9th of Muharram. It seems unlikely to me that there weren't early attempts to get water. And in fact, we will see at least one Maktal says, no, 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 all of this happened on the 7th of Muharram. That's why Al-Abbas is remembered on the 7th because the seventh was the day of water fetching. I myself, thinking logically, suspect that there may have been a number of attempts to get water, not just this one, but this is the one that's recorded because of the conversation that happens during it. So, so if you read the more contemporary Makdal, that's Abd al he died in 1971, he says the seventh, but when, whether it's the seventh or the ninth, I think Al-Mufid is wrong don't think it was on the day of the battle, because there is no way that they could have sent a large group of people. So if there was an attempt, according to Al-Mufid, on the day of the battle to get water, then for some reason Al-Mufid has abandoned this story, and he's telling a different story about Al-Abbas and Al-Hussein by themselves attempting to get water. The antagonist in other words, the one who causes all the problems is this man called Amr bin al-Hajjaj al-Zubaydi. 
for those who read these texts, he was one of the people who wrote to Al Hussein saying, come to Kufa and help us. And then he changed his mind and joined the army of Umar bin Sa'd. So he was commanding the right wing of Umar bin Sa'd's army, and he was the one having invited Al Hussein in the first place, who is now in charge of blocking Al Hussein from access to water. And in fact, he would publicly accuse Al Hussein of being an apostate from the true religion, and then he would disappear forever into history. We have no idea what happened to him. We know the end of some of the others, but not him. The, the, the man who is named as Nafi bin al-Hilal is a big problem. The reason he's a problem is because Umar bin Sa'd had a soldier whose name was Hilal bin Nafi. And he's a different man. And al-Majlisi transmits an error in the text in which it becomes not um, Nafi bin Hilal, but Hilal bin Nafi, who is with Al Abbas, but Hilal bin Nafi was not. He was an enemy soldier who happened to share the same name. So if you read the text carefully, some of the texts, the, the name is changed around. And Al Majlisi, for some reason, transmits the text without noting this is an error. In fact, it's, it's the wrong man. So Hilal bin Nafi was certainly a member of the forces of Umar bin Sa'd. He was a narrator of Karbala, but he was also apparently an eyewitness to the death of Al Hussein. So Abd, Abd al-Razak in his, his maktal records the words of Hilal bin Nafi standing over the body of Al Hussein saying, never in my life have I seen anyone with a better face or a face that was so glowing as was his face. In fact, the light that shone from his face so distracted me that I lost all thought of helping to kill him. Nafi, uh, Hilal bin Nafi. But in fact, our friend Nafi bin Hilal was a companion of Ali and he was a devoted so supporter of Al Hussein. Apart from Abu Mihna, very few Shi texts or even Shi sympathetic texts put Nafi in the story for the fight over water. As the years go by, the story changes and Al Abbas becomes the lead player. But in the earliest Shia and Sunni texts, it is Nafi and Abbas with him. Um, our friend Dinawari, um, so let me just swap over. Our friend Dinawari is the only one of these four texts who says the seventh of Muharram. All the others, the Maktal of Abu Mihnaf, Tabari and Buladri, all say the night, and we presume the ninth. But Dinawari actually says it was on the seventh. He doesn't name Umm al-Banin, but he tells the, your, his reader where the mother of al-Abbas comes from. And he notes very carefully that it was not Abbas carrying the standard, but Nafi bin al-Hilal in this particular moment. And he suggests that, in fact, they went to do battle, not just to get water. He says the language, or the language that Dinawari uses suggests that these 20 to 50 men weren't just going to fetch water, they were actually going to engage the enemy. That doesn't seem right to me because Al Hussein makes it clear that he doesn't want to be the first one to engage in battle. So I think this is Dinawari who is looking at the number being sent to fetch water and presuming that it's going to be that. Now, Abd al-Razak, many people read his maktal. So he died in 1971. Many people read his maktal, but he has stories in his maktal that are not found in the earlier works. So he has three attempts to fetch water. The first is the one we've just read from Abu Mihnaf the night before. Abu Mihnaf, at least um, uh, Abd al-Razak says that Al-Abbas actually volunteers because he hears the cries of the children. And Al-Hussein is very reluctant to let him go, but lets him go anyway, and the story unfolds as we've read it. But there's a second event, says Abd al-Razak, after the death of Al-Hussein's infant son, Ali al-Asghar, when Al Hussein takes on Amr bin Hajjaj at the river and says Amr bin Hajjaj had 4,000 men, but we don't know where Abdul Razak got that number from. 
and that Al Hussein by himself cleared a path through these 4,000 men, got his horse to water and refused to drink before his horse had drunk. It's a beautiful thought, but it's a later addition. We're not sure where it comes from, where the number comes from. And then he also records, thirdly, in his Maktal, an event on the day of battle when Abbas again fetches water and is killed as he does it, his hands chopped off. So that story of this terrible death of Al-Abbas is a much later event. And then just to, to finish off, and again, these are preliminary ideas which I need to, and I hope others too, will investigate a little more to discover how did the story of Al-Abbas which was transmitted firstly from a Shia into three Sunni texts, how did it become so different in the later texts? Because what we end up with is five possibilities. Number one, Al-Abbas was killed just before Al-Hussein was killed as together they approached the river or a dam at the, in the closing moments or the closing hours, moments of the battle. That's our first option. Secondly, Al-Abbas was killed just before Al-Hussein without any reference to them looking for water. Al-Hussein says, now my back is broken as he sees his half-brother lying on the ground, but no reference to water at all. Thirdly, there's the possibility that Al-Abbas actually successfully did bring water back sometime before the battle, maybe even more than once, or maybe others went. It seems hard that if the second of Muharram was the day that the water was forbidden to them, that they only went once to fetch water. That seems unlikely to me. There must have been a number of attempts, but there was one attempt in which the brother of Al-Hussein himself went to, to, to fetch water. Fourthly, the possibility that Al-Abbas was killed on the day of Ashura, according to Abd razak in his Maktel, trying to fetch water. And fifthly, there is the point that maybe Abbas went more than once for water. Maybe he went on the seventh and again on the ninth. But if on the ninth, he was also busy negotiating with the enemy and there was this movement between the enemy camp and Hussein's camp, one wonders when did he also go and fetch water and engage there with the enemy. So perhaps it was on the seventh. Having looked at that first text we looked at, as it's carried by the Sunni, the later Sunni scholars cut the whole story. So the famous Ibn al-Athir gives it three lines. He says, when the thirst of Al-Hussein and his companions became intense, he ordered his brother Al-Abbas to march with 20 men carrying water skins as well as 30 horsemen. They approached the water, they fought over it, they filled their, their skins and they returned. Three lines in his history. So the later Sunni scholars have cut all the details out, but the later Shia scholars have added details that have come from somewhere else, and we're not sure where they came from. So I leave that with you. It's an interesting, it's an interesting issue because there's no doubt that Al-Abbas was involved in these things. My interest as an historian is to find out when did he do them? On what particular moment of the battle did all this negotiation and the water fetching happen? And how often did it happen? So, um, is there questions? If I'm... Wonderful. Thank you very much for your talk, uh, Father Christopher. Um, we'll now open the floor to any questions directly. Can I please request that all questions on the topics we have discussed in this lecture series? So if you have any questions, please just raise them. I'll float this mic over to you somehow. Thank you so much for... Um, Yeah. 
So the first question was about which are the sources that are the ones one should go to for authentic accounts, and the second question is about the authenticity of Miknaf. So let's begin with the second one, because absolutely not. That's the problem. There, there are a number of maktals that float around, maqatil, that float around that just aren't valid. I know lots of people read Abdur Razak, but I don't know where he got a lot of his information from. I think that a lot of his information comes from Majalis and from, from other moments. And, and then it's not wrong. I think it's very important to fill out the story. But I, I'm writing as an historian, and so I'm interested in the bare facts about, in this case, Al-Abbas. So the book that exists, and I've got a copy of the so-called um, Maktal of Abu Mihnaf, is not Abu Mihnaf's. But I do believe, as do other Western scholars of Shi history, I do believe that in some of those early Sunni books, like Tabari, quite a big chunk of, of Mihnaf exists because they... Abu Mihnaf seemingly was a companion of Jaffa Sadiq, seems. So even though he's known as a Shia, the Sunni historians trust his reports, and they put his reports into their work. And the, the greatest thing about Abu Mihnaf is the whole of his Karbala account, the bits we've got, is based on eyewitnesses, people who actually saw little details. And as we said last night, when somebody sees the strap of a boy's sandal being broken, you just know you're dealing with real eyewitness. So I trust those early Sunni historians. And, and the fact that they tell the story of Al-Abbas so fully suggests that anti-Shi sentiment had not yet set in where they were trying to, it was only later on that the role of, the, of, of, of these men at Karbala was reduced. Now, I, you know, again, I, I write history, so I'm interested in the historians, less so the Hadith. I go to the Hadith eventually, but there are not that many Hadith about Al-Abbas. So I always begin with the historians, and because I write history in and around the event of Karbala, I usually begin with the bits of Abu Mihnaf that I can find. So Tabari, Baladri, all of these early Sunni historians, the best information about Zainab is found in those early, they're the ones who tell us about Zainab. Her story is transmitted, but I go to them first because in fact the truth is they're not that many Shi historians. There are lots of Sunni historians. The Shia were more interested in theology and in defining things like imama, defining what taqiyya is, defining all of those important delegation. History wasn't as important to them because the history was preserved in the collective memory of the Ahl Bayt. So, so they didn't feel the need to write chronicles. These men are not even historians, they write chronicles, just Tabaris in endless volumes. Every year he's got a volume of history. But they're very good sources for early. So that's where I begin, in short. Sorry, that was a bit long. I, I begin with, with the historians. And one gets a sense. The moment you, you see it, so I now look for every tiny detail. And I get a gut feeling about a detail that I haven't seen before. Where did this come from? So it's only much later that the story of Al-Hussein having his hands cut off only came in much later. So then I say, well, where did this come from? Can I find it? I can't find it in the early Shi texts either. It's, it's a later, it's a later edition. And I'm not saying that that means it's wrong. It could well have been a, an edition that was carried by memory. I mean, I come from a church tradition where a great deal of our teaching was passed down by word of mouth, not by written. So I get that as well. But those are the things that I'm trying to investigate. Yeah. Thank you very much. Are there any questions? Uh, first of all, thank you so much for such an eye-opening talk. I think it's very refreshing to hear, um, you know, like a neutral perspective because I feel that as Shias, we are very much emotionally involved and it's really hard to look at it objectively sometimes. I was just wondering whether, what your thoughts are on whether the later development of Shi theology would have had some kind of impact in the way the event of Karbala, the story has changed in the fact that later theologian might have looked back on historical facts and tried to reinterpret them in a way that would justify their, um, you know, their positions and their views. And also uh, whether the Safavid period much later on uh, would have had some kind of impact as well in promoting these different versions of the event. Point, did you make it? History is written backwards. 
That's how history is written. I mean, it may be eyewitness events, but it's written by future generations looking back, and sometimes looking back to what they think is a golden age, which if you were living there, you would have said it wasn't actually that golden, really. But, but nonetheless, that's how we write history. So, um, I mean, I, I've been challenged on this, but, but my own understanding, the classical understanding, is that the most important of the Ethnashari theology really was produced by men like al-Bakir, Jafar Sadiq after him, and, and the groups around them. So Jafar Sadiq seems to me, and I might be wrong, but it seems to me that, that he spent a great deal of his time with all the chaos going outside in Kufa, instructing his disciples, those who were around him, including a number of Sunni scholars, and formulating the theology that distinguishes the, the, the Ithna Ashari from other groups, because it was quite an important distinction that had to be made. During the Safavid period, of course, there was this patronage. The Safavids gave a certain patronage to scholarship. And so the, many of the Shi scholars were more free to write and to write expansively. And that must have influenced the way they wrote history. They could, they could expand characters and draw out ideas, taking earlier teaching and, and saying, well, you know, you look at a person like al Abbas and you can create a theology around him that's not false because theology is not necessarily based on historical fact. Theology is a, is a different science. So you could do that. And I have no doubt that as Shia Islam began to breathe again, during the Safavid period especially, as the scholars felt this kind of weight lifting from them, but also as they realized that now that the Imam was in occultation, they, they had to give guidance to their people. They couldn't just leave it. Somebody had to guide the people in, on his behalf, if, if you like. So there was that double realization, and I think they wrote a huge amount of theology, spirituality, many of the prayers, the ziyara. Um, but I also think that they, they took all kinds of elements and created a much bigger story. So the, the al-Bas al -Bas of Abu Mihnaf, after the time of Jaffa Sadiq, becomes a much bigger figure. For good reason, because he's presented to the, the people as a model of selflessness, as an exceptionally heroic man, and he was all those things. But I think your point about the Safavids is crucial, that, that there's this sigh of relief as suddenly there's patronage and scholars can write again. And there's this huge movement throughout the world of, of Shia scholars going to places where they can write freely and be free. And I have no doubt that they expanded greatly their hagiography, you know, the story of the awliya is, is in Sunni theology too, very important, books of the saints or the holy ones, and also expanded the, the stories themselves from a very simple story to quite a complex story. I don't think we should invalidate these stories, even if they contain elements that we don't know where they come from. They are part of the collective consciousness of people down through the ages. And so when we hear these heroic stories of Al-Abbas, it's not just fiction. It has its roots in a true event. And even if some of the, some of the details around that event have been expanded in different directions, it's still an important story that gets told from generation to generation. So we don't want to just cut, cut it either. Q&A session. Um, so can we please uh, give Father Christopher a loud salawat. Thank you very much. Uh, just tell you tomorrow to say that again. Can I also call on Minhal and Sunni lines of poetry, please? Salawat. Holy and free.
kingdom for humanity. These are the sons of the one that God calls. An-Nur as-Siraj munir These are the masters of the youth of paradise who gave their lives to guide us on to the right. Victorious they lay, martyred on the sands, Fourteen hundred years the true message still stands. Kings of Karbala that stood hand in hand, blessings on to them, you and I we send. How could the sons of Muhammad be slain? Ask yourself, Ain al Hassani wal Hussein. Ain al Hassani, Ain al Hussein, Ain abna. Al Hussein, Ain al Hassani, Ain al Hussein, Ain Abna al Hussein. Exemplary our Imams in every way, a revolution in our hearts will start today. To fight against all injustice is what they'd say to those believers that would follow in their way. These are the sons of the one that God calls. An-Nur as-Siraj munir These are the masters of the youth of paradise who gave their lives to guide us on to the right. Oh, every Muslim should love Muhammad's Ahlul Bayt for it's with them the holy book does resonate, and it's in their footsteps we'll need to emulate, to be the best we can before it is too late. How could the sons of Muhammad be slain? Ask yourself, Ain al-Hassani wal-Hussein. Ain al-Hassani, Ain al-Hussein, Ain abna. Al Hussein, Ain Al Hassani, Ain Al Hussein, Ain Abna Al Hussein. O oh, Muslims, this should make you realize that the Ark of Al Hussein cannot capsize, and to board it is a must for you and I to radiate the best of virtues in our lives. These are the sons of the one that God calls. An-Nur as-Siraj munir These are the masters of the youth of paradise who gave their lives to guide us on to the right. Truth and freedom and justice is what was earned. So learn from Karbala, then practice what you've learned. Fidelity, patience, love and charity. Adopt these traits, they are a part of your duty. Infallibles who hadn't given their lives in vain. Live your lives like Hassani wal Hussein. Ain al Hassani, Ain al Hussein, Ain Abna al Hussein. Ain al Hassani, Ain al Hussein, Ain Abna al Hussein. Ain al Hassani, Ain al Hussein, Ain Abna al Hussein. Salat. Thank you, gents, for those insightful words. Just a couple of announcements. There will be a selection of the latest publications by AMI Press available in the foyer um, outside. Cash and card payments are both accepted. Tomorrow's night program will start at 7.45 p.m., inshallah, with namaz, followed by Quran, and then followed by the lecture. After tonight's ziyarat, refreshments will be served in the dining room, so please feel free to have your refreshments either in the dining room or outside uh, in the front garden. Uh, before I let you all go, can I please ask Sheikh Mahmoud to give us a few words? Sallu ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad.
بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم السلام عليكم جميعا ورحمة الله وبركاته The other day we played a voice clip about the situation in Pakistan. Today we want to play a short video, but before playing the video, again, I want to share with you this extremely moving verse. It's found in Surah Nisa, verse number one. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. Ya Yuhannas. اتقوا ربكم الذي خلقكم من نفس واحدة. O mankind, be wary of your Lord who created you from a single soul. There is a lot that we can draw from this verse. The singularity of the soul and weariness of the God is mentioned together. In this clip that you will see, you will see old people, your peers, and you will see children. If you look closer in the old people, you might see your own parents. In your peers, you will see your own brothers and sisters. In the young people, you will see your children. And if you look even closer, in all of them you will actually see yourself. Just as the verse speaks, it is a situation of desperation, but you will also see hope. It is darkness, but you will also see light. Beta Charitable Trust is not only distributing Russian food packs and other necessary items among the flood affectees in Pakistan, but is also providing medical relief to the people. The Trust has planned to organize three medical camps for the flood affectees each to provide free medical treatment for 15 days. The medical camps will be set up in District Larkana and District Khairpur. So far, four mobile medical camps were set up, one of which is this one in a village in District Khairpur. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. First of all, we are thankful for the Charity Trust, which has put our goat in a medical camp in the village of Rais Murad Khan. My name is Rais Amir Ali Jiskani. और ये गांव है हमारा ये यूसी जिसका नहीं लगती है तहसील कोडी जी डिस्ट्रिक्ट खैरपुर मीरस यहाँ पे फ्लड ने बड़ा नुकसान किया लोगों की फसलें तबाह की हैं घर तबाह किए हैं डैमेज किए हैं आबादी जो है वो तकरीबन हमारे पास यहाँ पे 800 से 1200 घर हैं हमारे सिटी जिसका नहीं में इसके अतराफ में जो ह� जो हम नेशनल हाईवे तक जाते हैं हमारा नेशनल हाईवे भी अभी तक डूबा हुआ है तो हम ट्रैक्टरों पे और उसपे जो है वो अपना मरीज या कोई डेड बॉडी या जो लोग फोटो रहे वो हम निकाल रहे हैं तो यहाँ पर बहुत बड़ी तकलीफ है पानी से बजन यहाँ पर डिजीज़ेस काफी हुई हैं लोगों को एलर्जी के बिल्कुल हमें ऐसी मेडिकल कैंप्स की जरूरत है जैसे आपके ट्रस्ट ने लगाई है हम आपके बड़े शुक्र को जा रहे हैं यहाँ पे मलेरिया के बड़े शूज हो रहे हैं इलर्जी के बड़े शूज हो रहे हैं यू कैन सी दैट this is where your assistance is going, alhamdulillah. Shining a light in this darkness, providing hope in this place of desperation. I want to end with a quote or a saying or a hadith of Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. Who so eloquently as he does capture things in one sentence. He says, 
quwwatul ajsadi ta'am the nourishment of the body is food and we know this and he says wa quwwat wa quwwatul arwahi al it'am whilst the nourishment of the soul is feeding others and you can see how this is amazingly linked together with the verse again that we are created from one soul feeding others is actually no less than feeding oneself if you like to support this you can see me at the desk at the entrance can we finally end with reciting surah fatiha for the marhumin whose names are on the screens take a moment to look at the names and pray for them and for all those who are unwell and for all those going through difficulties al fatiha